finding. 1 Corinthians chapter number 8. 1 Corinthians chapter number 8. I also want you to put a finger in uh, Psalm 115 if you would. It's the only passage I'll be mentioning many tonight. But uh, I do want you in, in a little bit to turn to that because I want us to see it together. 1 Corinthians chapter number 8. You guys that, that have those sheets, I want you to go ahead and be passing those out. Brother Greg, you have those. Some of you guys over here have them. Uh, uh, Greg laid this uh, a copy of this on my desk this morning and uh, just so happens that it's where we are in 1 Corinthians chapter number 8. Just some good basic principles on uh, making good decisions uh, that we don't see explicitly dealt with in Scripture on many issues. On many issues. The Bible is very specific. I mean, we know for absolute certainty that we should not murder. We know for absolute certainty that we should not dishonor our mother and father. We know for absolute certainty that we should not steal. We know that we uh, should not uh, covet. We should not lust. We should not commit adultery. With absolutely zero ambiguity, the Bible teaches that our lives as believers are to be characterized by the worship of God, the knowledge of the Word of God, love for our neighbors. We are to have grace in our relationships, both positively and negatively. The Bible gives us much teaching that is black and white. I mean, it is right there. It is spelled out. However, there are many issues for which you and I would say are maybe gray areas. We can't find a, a chapter and a verse. We can't find a clear-cut command about it. We, we may call these gray areas. And, and that's what we're speaking about tonight, gray matter. It's the uh, uh, first of two messages I'm going to share from Verse number 8. Great. They may not be black and white. There are no easy answers. There are sincere believers who, who uh, disagree with how to interpret them. Some examples may be <clears throat> use of tobacco, um, cutting grass on Sunday. How many of your parents ever told you when you was growing up, I'll kill you, boy, if you get on that lawnmower? Hey, when I first came, when I first came to Blue Ridge View, Miss Verna, she might get on to me right now, but I first came to Blue Ridge View, and, and uh, we had our 4th of July thing, man, it was on Sunday, I was going to shoot fireworks all off this mountain, and a couple of them pulled me aside and said, Preacher, we don't shoot fireworks on Sunday. <laughs> I'd never, I'd never heard that, I didn't know that, but I understood, I understood after, after, uh, uh, talking to them uh, exactly what they meant about uh, certain things. And so, uh, gambling, just things like that, that you can't go to a chapter and verse. Uh, certain denominations and churches, uh, these issues may include dancing, uh, the wearing of makeup, going to movies. Should I go to an R-rated movie? Should I go to a PG mo movie? Um, should I dance? I like dancing. I need to listen to this message. Amen? Uh, the reason we struggle with gray areas is that they're not specifically singled out in Scripture. We, we cannot speak against them with chapter and verse. Now we have already learned, listen, listen we, know, we know what Paul's doing here. We're talking about the church being the church now and uh, being that light in a dark world. Remember, he's writing to a church that had been planted in the city of Corinth a city of evil, a city of degradation. I mean, it was just a wicked place. And so Paul plants, uh, or they planted a church there, and Paul's writing a letter in response to some questions that the members of the Corinthian church had. And uh, the, uh, chapter 7 began with answering some of those questions. And so he's doing his very best, you know, to say, Here, here's what you need to do, here's what you need to do. And up until chapter 8, he's been very, very specific concerning things of marriage and, and immorality. Now, uh, we understand, and, and really, listen, I, this is, I was thinking about this on the front pew a while ago. You need, in order to understand Corinthian, 1 Corinthians and even 2 Corinthians, You've got to take it as a building block book. You, you, we're building blocks from chapter 1 to chapter
chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 5, chapter 6, and now into chapter 7. Chapter 7 really is just a continuation, or chapter 8 is a continuation of, of what was going on in chapter 7, just a different subject. Remember your Bible when it was first written didn't have uh, ch chapter headings and verse headings. So uh, they, they've been placed in here to help us better have a clearer reading of it. And so it's really a building block book. And, and if there's anything we have learned or we should learn from the Word of God, not just from the book of 1 Corinthians, uh, but other uh, places in Scripture, even from Christ's teaching, we understand that in Christ, in our salvation, the believer has great freedom. We call it Christian liberty. Uh, Jesus would say in John chapter 8, verse 31, He said, If you abide in my word, you're my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth. And what? The truth shall make you free. 2 Corinthians 3, 17, The Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, what's there? There is liberty. Galatians 5 verse 1 Stand thou therefore in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. Do not be entangled again with what? The yoke of bondage. Now there are two extremes when we're talking about gray areas. The first extreme is legalism. Legalism. The legalist believes that everything is black and white. Everything is right or wrong. They'll even make up verses. <laughs> Uh, to tell you this is right or wrong. Legalists live by rules rather than by the Spirit. Legalists keep list of what real Christians should do and what they should not do. Legalists make it their business to keep tabs on everybody around them. The legalist life is controlled by the law and not by the Spirit. Legalism stifles liberty. But the other extreme when we're dealing with gray matter is license. License. License sees almost everything as white. I mean, uh, uh, we just say Christ has forgiven us of all our sins, and, and so as long as what I'm doing is, is not expressly forbidden in Scripture, and as long as I don't feel guilty about it, I may just go ahead and have a good time. Now that'll get you in trouble right there. 1 Corinthians 8 helps us strike the balance between these two extremes. Uh, remember now that the Corinthians had obviously written the Apostle Paul uh, a letter with many questions. He began chapter 7, Now concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto me. And throughout chapter 7, he deals with some of those issues about marriage and divorce and the single life. And now he begins chapter 8 with, Now, concerning those things, offered to idols. So obviously the Corinthians had questions about marriage, but they also had questions about how to deal with things that had been offered unto idols. And you'll see what we mean by that in a moment. They seem to have been divided about this. And so they wanted to know what Paul's teaching was. And so in response, Paul lays down three truths concerning idolatry and then he offers an overarching principle to help all Christians deal with, with what we sometimes call gray areas. Now, we, we don't have time to adequately look at everything tonight. That's why we're splitting it up. I'm going to share with you three truths and then next week we'll look at the three principles. All right, truth number one. I want you to look at it. First of all, write this down. Knowledge brings liberty. Look at, look at chapter 8. I'm going to go ahead and read through verse 8. Now, he's just, he's just continuing. Now is touching things offered unto idols. You, you've written to me about this. We know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up. But charity edifieth. Charity, the word there is just love. And if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing, yet as he ought to know. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. As concerning therefore, here it is, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols. Now listen to what Paul says. He, he, he sums it up right here in verse 4. Notice what he says. You, you're worried about this meat that's been offered to idol, whether you should eat unto idols, whether you should eat it or not. Here's what he says. Look at verse 4. We know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is none other God but one. He 
he clears it up for them right there. But, but listen, he keeps going. For though there be that are called gods, which in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many and lords many, but to us, he's talking to believers, there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. How be it? There is not in every man that knowledge. For some with conscience of the idol unto this hour eat it as a thing offered unto an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. But listen to verse 8. But me commendeth us not to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. All right, the first truth I want you to see tonight is this. Paul tells us that knowledge, with knowledge, comes liberty. With knowledge comes liberty. Now, uh, there's a question. The question for Paul is, is, we just read in the first part of verse 1, is concerning those things offered to idols. That, that phrase, uh, offered uh, things offered to idols, it comes from one Greek word which means idol sacrifices. Specifically, these were food sacrifices made to idols representing the false deities of Rome and Greece. The people of the Roman Empire were polytheistic. That means they had all kind of gods. They didn't be just believe in one God. They had gods uh, for sowing. They had gods for harvest. They had gods for fertility and so on and so on and, on and so on. They also believed, listen to this, and it will help you understand what Paul just said. They also believed the air was filled with demonic spirits that tried to enter into and possess men. And one of the ways evil spirits entered men, they believed, was by attaching themselves to food. I knew there was something about them coming from. <laughs> They're demonic. <laughs> so, so these pagans developed the practice of sanctifying meat by first offering it to idols. This way, this way, they believed that it gained them favor with their gods and it cleansed the food from evil spirits, making it safe to eat. And, and so an animal sacrifice, get this picture in your mind, a, a sacrificed animal, animal was divided into three parts. The first part was burned completely on an altar. It was consumed on an altar as the main sacrifice. The second part of the meat was given to the priest uh, to take care of them. And then the third part was taken home by the worshiper uh, after being blessed by the priest and certified to be free of demonic spirits. And of course the priest, they couldn't eat all of that meat that had been brought to the sacrificial altar that, that they could have taken home. They couldn't eat all that meat and so what did they do? They took it down to the marketplace. And they were it was sold down there at the grocery store. Now, obviously... Remember, in the Bible, only the best animals were used for sacrifice. So this meat that was sold down at Publix, I mean, it was grade A, wonderful, grass-fed, hormone-free beef. I mean, it was the best T-bone, New York strip, filet, prime rib. Let's get out of here. Amen. <laughs> I mean, it was the best that you could find. And since it was certified to be free of demons, it was even more valuable. So it was the best meat available. It was served at weddings, at banquets, at, at uh, uh, feasts, other occasions. It was very difficult, though. So uh, it was very difficult to avoid eating meat that had been sacrificed to animals in that day. It was very, very difficult if you wanted to eat the good meat. One group of Corinthian believers struggled with eating this meat. In their minds, it was profane because it had come into contact with idol worship. For some, it reminded them of their former lives where uh, when they worshiped false gods, they feared others would think they had, had gone back on God. They, they feared that others would think that they had backslidden and rejected Christ and returned to paganism. And still others avoided this meat because they thought it made them appear to be less spiritual. And then the other group of Corinthian Christians understood their liberty in Christ. 
they were not bothered by where the meat had come from. To them, meat was meat. Steak was steak. They knew these false gods didn't exist. They knew demons could not attach to food. And they freely ate and enjoyed this meat that had been offered to idols. So, so Paul begins to deal with that question of food offered to idols. Now, the second thing there is that Paul tells us that we all have knowledge. Look at it in verse number 1 again. We know that we all have knowledge. All the Corinthian believers... According to the Apostle Paul, they all had knowledge that the gods being worshipped in those temples did not exist. They all had that knowledge. They, they had learned the truth of Jesus Christ. They were living out what Jesus said in John chapter 8 and verse 32. And you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Some were liberated completely by this knowledge. Their study of the Word of God that they had convinced them that because these pagan gods did not exist, then any meat associated with their sacrifices was harmless. I mean, I can sit down and I can enjoy this steak. In fact, the context, the context of the way this is written leads me to believe that these believers were somewhat arrogant in their beliefs. They tended to look down at their brothers and sisters who were not comfortable with eating this meat. Their knowledge made them self-righteous. And their self-righteousness made them turn up their nose at their brothers and sisters in the church. So Paul says, we all have knowledge. But notice, he goes on in verse 1 into, into verse number 3. He reminds us that knowledge, if we're not careful, knowledge will make us proud. It puffs up. Puffs up. If you've ever run into a very, very smart believer, sometimes you're almost intimidated to talk to them. You ever, you ever been around anybody like that, a Christian like that? And, and I've been around some that didn't mean to do that, but I've been around some that did mean to do that. That did, did make you want to make you feel inferior. So Paul says, now listen, we, guys, we know we all have knowledge. In other words, we all have the knowledge that these pagan gods don't exist. But Paul goes on, takes it a step further though. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifies. Knowledge puffs up, but, but love builds. My, how we need knowledge of God's Word. Amen? Friend, I've been in the ministry many years now. I have studied the Bible a great deal. Yet if there is one truth I know for sure, it is that there is so much more to know than I know right now. I don't have it figured out. It's like climbing mountains. I reach one peak, and when I get to that crest, I look over and I see another mountain peak. Knowing the Word of God is so vital. Unfortunately, and some of these preachers in here will tell you this, unfortunately, we live in an age in which church leaders are dumbing down the Bible. They're dumbing down the Scripture. The problem with that is people can't practice what they don't know. We can't expect them to obey what they don't understand. We're at a time as in the days of Hosea when God said, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. The reason that so many believers struggle so hard with sin is that they don't know the truth and so they're not made free in Jesus. They battle it every single day. I, I'm thankful to be a part of a church that is dedicated to seeking out the truth of the Word of God. Right here in the Bible. I believe we have, and I don't want to sound too puffy right here, but I, I believe we have a biblically astute congregation. I've listened to some of y'all teach Sunday school. I, I have sat around and I've discussed theology with many of you. Yet at the same time, we must guard carefully that we don't become puffed up. When we don't balance knowledge with love, we become arrogant and prideful. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifies. There's got to be a balance. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 says, Love suffers long and is, a, and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not, listen to this, parade itself. It is not puffed up. True knowledge of the Scripture should not build arrogance. It ought to promote humility. Because we know that we were depraved sinners justly. Justly condemned to hell. 
and because we know that God in His great grace reached down to us, we ought to be the most humble people on the face of the earth because we understand the true meaning of God so loved the world that we ought to so love the world. Amen? Now note verse 2. Notice what, And if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing, yet as he ought to know. The Christian who goes around thinking he has a handle on the truth really knows nothing as he ought to know. He may have right knowledge, but Paul says he has a wrong understanding. Matter of fact, in verse 9, Paul says he's become a stumbling block to others. Now look at verse number 3. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. The love of God is one of the glaring characteristics of true salvation. And the love of God is always manifest by loving those whom God loves. Could I get an amen right there? Loving those whom God loves. Loves. First John 5 1. Just to paraphrase. Basically, John said, Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ born of God and everyone who loves him, who the God also loves him who is begotten of him. First John 3 14. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. So the first truth, first truth, knowledge brings liberty. Second truth, right here, write it down. Idols are not real. Idols are not real. Look at verse number four. Let's look at it. As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is none other God but one. Verse four explains... What we know, and what we know, what you and I know, is that an idol is nothing in this world. It really does not exist. It's not real. It's not a true God. It's not a, it's not a true Lord. You and I know that. Since the fall of man in the Garden of Eden, idolatry has been a plague and it continues even to this day. Idols have been made from all manner of stone, wood, precious materials. But listen to me, they're not real. They're not real. Psalm 115, turn there real quick. Psalm 115. You know what, in our day, I mean, we, we talk about how far advanced we are and how enlightened we are. Do you know we still got people that make pilgrimages of thousands of miles to holy shrines? I mean, we got people every, every year that will go somewhere and bow down at a temple and, and, and believe that uh, somebody's bones are somewhere buried inside that temple. We have, we have people that will hike up a mountain, go up, uh, go up a mountain to, to bow before and to see a, a, an idol, a statue of a little naked fat man sitting on a tree stump. I mean, I mean, we've got people that do this all the time. I'm serious. In our enlightened culture. But listen to what the psalmist said. Psalm 115, not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name give glory. For thy mercy and for thy truth's sake. Wherefore should the heathen say, where is now their God? But our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. Their idols are silver and gold. The work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes have they, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Noses have they, but they smell not. They have hands, but they handle not. Feet have they, but they walk not. Neither speak they through their throat. They that make them are like unto them, so is every one that trusteth in them. Verse 5. For though there be, in, back in 1 Corinthians 8, for though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods, Many and Lord's many. That tells us something about the nature and the number of idolatrous gods. Uh, ancient history records list after list of so, so-called gods set up as idols and worshipped by man. Biblical history records uh, uh, the names of the gods of the Egyptians and the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Canaanites, and many more. 
Even today, India's Hindus number their gods and their idols in the thousands of all these so-called gods. 100% are nothing but fake. They are not real. They are the creation of men's minds and, and hands. Now, look at verse 6. But to us, there is but one God. Listen to this. The Father of whom are all things and we in Him and one Lord Jesus Christ by whom are all things and we by Him. We don't worship other so-called gods. We worship the God. The God of heaven. Whom Paul says is the Father of whom all uh, the Father of whom are all things. He's come to us through the one Lord Jesus Christ, and through Him we have life. There may be many diverse false gods worshipped in this world, but for us there is no other God. And even if someone else believes in some other God, they are believing in a false God. It's fake. It's created by the hands of men. And some will tell you today, some will try to convince you today that we as Christians have, have uh, created God. Oh no, my friend. God created us. Now Paul says in verse 7, How be it there is not in every man that knowledge. Not everybody, Paul says, understands this. For some with conscience of the idol unto this hour eat it as a thing offered unto an idol, and their conscience being weak is... Defile. Every believer, remember, remember, they've just gotten saved, a lot of them. They're getting saved here and there. They were joining the church, getting involved in the church. But we can't expect a brand new Christian to be matured overnight. And so they didn't quite have this understanding. Many new converts obviously still believed there were other gods. So they didn't grasp the fact that the other gods they worshipped all their lives didn't exist. I mean, they couldn't just forget about that overnight. They believed on Christ, yet they did not know that the other gods were not real. They knew there was only one right God. They just hadn't come to the point where they understood that He was the only real God. Amen. So when these, when these believers ate meat that had been offered or sacrificed to idols, they had consciousness of the eye. In the back of their mind, they were thinking, should I really do this? I mean, this meat that I'm eating, even though it's great, even though it's good, even though the priest said there's no demons in it that can attach itself to me, should I eat it? Because it has, it has been in the midst of, of idols. They didn't enjoy or just enjoy the T-bone steak. When they ate the steak, they ate it as a thing offered to an idol. They, they couldn't enjoy the meat because of the connotation. Why? Because they're conscious. Being weak is defiled, Paul said. Eating such meat violated their weak conscience. Now I want you to listen to what I'm about to tell you. It is never wise or safe to violate your conscience. Are you listening to me? Young people, are you listening to me? It is never wise nor safe to violate your conscience. Your conscience is a warning light on the dashboard of your heart, on the, like the dashboard of your car. When it comes on, there is a problem that must be addressed, and to ignore your conscience very well could be disastrous in your life. And so if these weak Corinthian believers ignored their con conscience, they would be confused. They would be resentful. They may have feelings... Of guilt. And so, uh, just listen to this little thing scribbled down. The teaching is if it seems wrong for you, it is wrong for you. Are you listening? If it seems wrong for you, then it's wrong for you. All right. Last truth. Knowledge brings liberty. We hadn't made application. We're going to do that next week. Idols are not real. And then truth number three. Food is food. Food is food. Uh, look at verse number 8. But meat commendeth us not to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. Eating food or not eating food has no spiritual significance. Un unless, of course, you're, you're fasting or 
something like that. But it has no spiritual significance otherwise. The word commendeth means to bring near. It means to bring near. So, so think about that in that neither eating nor not eating meat sacrificed to idols will bring us near to God. Ne neither one. Doing those things which God has not forbidden have no bearing on our relationship to Him. Food is a good example of that. Now listen, listen. Common sense ought to uh, compel us to be careful about what we eat and how much we eat. Of this there is no gray area. Gluttony is a sin. It is a lack of self-control. Eating is not a sin. It's not what we put in that is sinful. It's what comes out of our depraved hearts. Jesus said in Mark 7, verse number 15, There is nothing that enters a man from outside which can defile him, but the things which come out of him, those are the things that defile a man. Raised as a strict Jew, Peter held to dietary laws until God gave him a vision of all types of animals. And the Lord told Peter in that vision, He said, kill and eat. Paul wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4.4 4, For every creature of God is good and nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving. Alright, before I close, I know this is kind of just kind of leaving us hanging. For you. No, we'll, we'll get to it next, the, the principles. But before we close, I want, us to, I want us to ask ourselves a couple of important questions. Number one, what are some gray areas in my life that I struggle with? What are some gray areas that I struggle with? Do I lean more toward legalism or license? Does my knowledge of God make me proud or does it humble me? Am I violating my conscience in any way if I do this? Am I violating my conscience in any way if I do this? I want you to look that paper we passed out. Eight tests for godly decision making. I made my son and my daughter read a book many years ago entitled uh, The Wisest Question Ever or The Best Question Ever. The Best Question Ever. And I still ask them from time. I hadn't asked them in a while. Harrison, what is the best question ever? What is the wise thing to do? It's the best question ever. What is the wise thing to do? Here's eight tests right here for godly decision making. 2 Timothy 3.16 All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Let me, let me see yours. Here, here, this is what I was looking for. The scriptural test. Has God already spoken about it in His Word? Number two. Test for good decision making? The secrecy test. Would it bother me if everyone knew that this was my choice? Wow. Proverbs 11.3. Go home and read these verses. The survey test. What if everyone followed my example? 1 Timothy 4.12. The fourth test for decision making is this. The spiritual test. Am I being people pressured or spirit led? Number five, the stumbling test. Could this cause another person to stumble? You may have a good conscience about it as a believer. It may be a gray area. I may not comport you to chapter and verse. But I still have to ask myself, if I engage in this, is it going to cause a weaker brother to stumble? And if it, if it causes a weaker brother to stumble, I'll stand before God for it, so I better leave it alone. Six, the serenity test. This is a good one. Have I prayed and received peace about this decision? Number seven, the sanctification test. Will this keep me from growing in the character of Christ? Can I do this and still draw near to Christ? And then the supreme test. Does this glorify God? That pretty much clears it up. Amen. Does this glorify God? First Corinthians 10. Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Heads are bowed, eyes are